evening, Phoenix Heights, YouTubers. I'm back. I took a couple weeks off, and two weeks is too long for me. I, one week is all I can take. I can't miss two services in a row anymore. That was tough on me. All right. Got a great Bible study for you tonight. <clears throat> nice to see you again, old friend from five years ago. Even people that meet me and then can't stand me eventually come back. It's weird. You know? <laughs> it's very odd. <laughs> so when somebody gets mad at me, I'm just no problem. I just a little patient. I know they'll be back in a few years. You're back. <clears throat> she was. We even get people come back from New Mexico. I can't believe I can't believe we don't have everybody coming back from New Mexico. I don't I don't get that. All right, let's go to the most exciting and interesting portion of the evening: the announcements. Here they are. October 27th, the next seminar coming up on the invisible world. There's a, there's a visible world, there's an invisible one. That would be an interesting seminar. There's all of our teachings on YouTube. Go to youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ, and all of our teachings are there. Thursdays and Friday nights are all carried there live. Been on the radio for over 40 years, uh, 20 years, excuse me, 40. I thought 20 was tough. <clears throat> I'm on every day of the week, Monday through Friday in the morning, and then I'm on Saturdays and Sundays on 10 10 a.m. I'm also on uh, 1160 a.m. That's a uh, conservative talk radio. I'm on at 8 o'clock Sunday mornings. You can get all my uh, radio shows. I archive all of them off the website. Hit the home page. Hit the media. Streaming radio. You're there. Here's my Sunday broadcast at 8 o'clock on 1100 a.m. That's not a Christian station. It's a conservative talk station. And here's my podcast every Sunday morning, 9 o'clock. Time change coming up in a week or so, correct? Okay. Just go to twitch.tv, put in HCCADC, and I'll see you Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. We'll talk together. Every month I have a deliverance training class coming up in the small sanctuary at noon on the 28th, Saturday. If you want to help out our ministry, you can sign up to Good Search instead of Google. You just put in our charity name. And they'll pay us while you surf the web. <clears throat> if you know somebody who needs to be delivered and they can't come here, no problemo. Send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. This miracle list works 100% of the time. If I can get people to do it, which is only about 10% of the time, the devil hates this list, and every time I send it out, people get so distracted that uh, you wouldn't even believe it. It's miraculous how the devil tries to stop this. But if you can do this miracle list, uh, you're going to get healed 100%. <clears throat> There's the uh, deliverance training course. It's in the bookstore, 18 classes. And I believe Sharon was at some of these classes over... The House of Healing years ago. We had the, I would teach the class, and then at the end of the class, the Holy Ghost would demonstrate what I was teaching live. It was freaky. I'd never seen any teaching like it anywhere. First the teaching, and then the demonstration. It's amazing. What's going on now? Find out. The seven churches of Revelation are in the bookstore. Please remember our Wednesday Zoom service. This thing's a killer. Rick and Stephanie on there just blowing demons out of people like bottle rockets. Six o'clock Pacific time, Arizona time. Send me an email and I'll send you the code and the password. Monday night is our Zoom service for the ladies with Julie. This thing is booming. Send me an email and I'll send you the code and the password. Plus, uh, Tuesday night is her meeting with the ladies in the small sanctuary. Mike, can we make an announcement real quick? Yeah. There's a BMW outside with the lights on. 
there's a BMW outside with the lights on, and our policy here is that uh, if, if it's a BMW, the vehicle is to be towed to my house. <laughs> so you have two minutes to turn the lights on. If not, my wife's calling tow truck. Thank you. Thank you for your donations. <clears throat> Download our Tithely app on your phone. You can donate anytime you want to. Thank you. The boxes on the doors are where we take donations during the services. Thank you for that. You can donate on the website by hitting the PayPal button. YouTubers, I want you to remember you're to set up an ambush team in your church. You only need two or three people. And then you start picking off the sick people in the church. And before you know it, you won't even believe it. You'll have people lining up to come see you. I know that from personal experience. I did it years ago at the Dream Center in Scottsdale. That was a mega church. It's not there anymore, but I had a, all kinds of, I was never short of people on Tuesday nights. As soon as the word spread, somebody got healed, they'll just start following you. They'll show up. Those are the three books I wrote. One's on Satan, one's on healing, one's on curing Christians who have mental illnesses. Here are our platforms. All of our services are loaded onto, thanks to Kelly. Here's some more. Friday rebroadcast services here. God to BitChute, and so on. You can watch them all over the place. We're doing real good on Rumble right now. Put in HOHHCC on Rumble. We're, you're there. Here it is. All right. Now, when you talk about Christianity, some things are essential to go to heaven, and some things are not essential. There's essential doctrines, and there's non-essential doctrines. Yeah? So if I did a teaching on hell, Armageddon, the millennial reign of Christ, the second coming, water baptism, uh, a bunch of stuff, okay? Those are, those are non-essential doctrines. You do not need to know about those doctrines to go from living here and dying and going to heaven, which is the ultimate goal of every Christian. When you die, you don't want to go to hell. You want to go to heaven. I mean, that's the big kahuna. Yeah? So there are non-essential doctrines and there are essential doctrines that you have to understand and you have to know to make that transition from this miserable existence here to the glory world. Guess which one we're going over tonight? That was a bad guess. Essential doctrines. Okay. Now let's take a look at three essential doctrines you have to understand to be able to figure out Christianity. Here's the chronology of them. First it's grace, then it's faith, then it's works. For example, let's go over step one. You must understand the concept of grace to make it to heaven. Grace is something that God gave us. Here it is, John 3.16. Everybody has this memorized, don't you? For God so loved the world, Greek word agapao, it's a Greek verb, it means to show love to someone, showing your love. For God so showed his love to the world, cosmos, human world, humanity. Jesus didn't die for trees, bugs, fish, or goats. He died for humans. That's the only thing the atonement covers is humans. God so loved humanity, he showed his love by giving his son so that humans would not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to Crino, judge the world. He sent his son to the world, cosmos, human world, so that the human world might be sozo delivered. Delivered from sin, sickness, demons, whatever. The Holy Ghost can deliver anybody from anything. Can he? All right. A couple people did not, but, you know, we get backslidden people here. Sozo, to be delivered. You can be delivered through anything through the cross of Calvary. Anything. Okay? Then it says, 
He that believes on him is not judged. He that believes not is already judged because he did not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Okay, Matthew 18 and Luke 9. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to sozo deliver them. Okay? This is all by God's grace. It has nothing whatsoever to do with humanity or me or you. We had nothing whatsoever to do with it. Absolutely nothing. Zero. All these verses, I am a total zero. I had nothing to do with this. This is what God's grace is. God decided out of love to extend grace to human beings. He did it on his own. He did it for his own reasons. I had nothing whatsoever to do with it. That's grace. John 12, if any man hears my words, Jesus said, and doesn't believe me, I am not going to judge him. I did not come to Crino judge the world. Notice that word here in the King James Bible was translated correctly here, but they use condemnation in the other verses. You happen to notice that? No? Okay, well, anyway, it's the same Greek word, just a different English word. Cosmos, human world, sozo, delivered. Here it is. Same Greek words. <clears throat> If you were able to grasp this subject, you would never question one of your prayers ever again for the rest of your life. You'd never question it. Well, I screwed up. I did this wrong. I did that wrong. You wouldn't, you wouldn't bother with that anymore. You know why? He's not judging you. I like my own Bible studies. <laughs> you screwed up. You blew it. No one's judging you. No one's sticking their finger in your face, Christ, saying, hey, you screwed up. That's not happening. I came not to judge humanity. I came to deliver. So, Cosmos, humanity. Is what that's saying. See that? You know, if you're if you're raised like a Baptist, have you ever met a Baptist? Holy smoke, really? Oh. You know, do you know what legalism is? If anybody understood these simple verses, they would never go back to the Baptist church and never. Get involved in legalism again. Stop doing that. Quit that. You screwed up. Stop it. Nitpick. 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 You would stop it. Because you're the only one doing it. Christ is not doing it. God is not doing it. Did Kelly put some poison gas in here? Because everybody, why is everybody staring at me like that? You don't recognize me? I was only gone two weeks. Huh? What happened? We have seen and testified, John, 1 John 4, that the Father sent the Son to be the judge of the world, the, the Savior of, same Greek word, cosmos, humanity, humans. Not fish, not insects, humans. That's God's favorite thing is a human. That really makes him happy. <clears throat> John 1. The next day, John saw Jesus coming to him. This is when he was baptized, right? And he says something incredible. 
There is the Lamb of God, which takes away, I wrote, to pick up and get rid of. If you had something in your house you wanted to get rid of, and you picked it up and you walked it out like that, that's I wrote. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of believers? No. Unbelievers? No. Everybody. Everybody. Good people? No. Rotten people? No. Everybody. First Peter chapter 2. Jesus in his own self bare our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sins should live to righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Your healing and your forgiveness all comes from Calvary. Yes. Bang. Galatians 3, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law because he was made a curse for us because everyone who is crucified is cursed by God. So if your parents were witch doctors and your uncle was a warlock, they're all cursed. You were cursed. Not anymore. First Corinthians, Second Corinthians five. God made Christ to be sin for us because he knew no sin. He was sinless. Why? So we could become the righteousness of God in Christ. That's unbelievable. When you murdered somebody, when you raped somebody, when you fondled a kid, when you shot somebody, when you stole something, when you cursed your head off, Christ did it. All that wicked sin that you did in your life transferred over to him. He became your sin. Pow. Pow. That means I don't have it anymore. It was transferred over to him. <laughs> Why did you do that? So I could be righteous before God. Could I be righteous on my own? Pfft, uh, what a joke. Are you kidding me? I suck. But when he became sin for me, I became the righteousness of God in Christ. <laughs> Why? I, he took it out. <laughs> now, little children, 1 John 2, little children, I'm writing to you, he says, if, if I write to you and explain this to you, I don't want you to sin. But if you do, if you do, what is a parakletos? What is that? Well, that's the same Greek word in John 14 when Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter. A parakletos is very similar to an attorney. It's somebody who comes by your side and helps you, stands by you and supports you in your time of need. A parakletos. Hi, you need help? I'm here. And he comes to you directly to the man of God right there. See? That's a parakletos. I'll help you. Here, I'll hold you up. I'll... I'll I got you. See that? A paracletos is a I got you person. You have a person to come by your side when you sin. Okay? Now John said, I don't want you to sin and here follow these instructions and you won't sin, but if you do, if you do, and I sinned uh, like four weeks ago, I got convicted over it been perfect ever since. I had, to, I had to have an advocate to help me. Yeah. 
He is what? Helasmas. He's my, he's the propitiation. That's a funny term, isn't it? It's an old English term. We don't use it anymore. His sinless life was sacrificed for me. He became my sin. He became my curse. And if I screw up, he comes to help. I can't lose. I can't lose. I got this down. How did all these benefits come to me? Grace had nothing to do with me. Nothing to do with me. Wow. Eureka. And not only us, not only Christians, but who else? Everyone. Because most of all of humanity, from this end of the world to that one, for 2,000 straight years, every single person, everybody, Christ died for their sins. Every single person. No exception. <laughs> Isaiah worded it best, didn't he? Yeah, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought like a lamb to the slaughter. The sheep before her shearers, he did not open his mouth. What's he talking about there? He didn't refuse it. He laid down his life. He didn't try to get out of it. John 10, therefore does my father love me because I lay down my suke soul that I may take it again. No man, same Greek word, Iro, picks me up and forces me to do it. I'm doing it myself. I'm voluntarily laying myself down for the sins of the whole world, good and bad and the ugly. Everybody. Christ, Savior of the world. <laughs> when the Savior of the world shows up, you don't have a sin problem anymore. You're good to go. How do I get all these benefits? Man, I must be an important person. Oh, far from it. Grace gave it to me. I fell into it. I got it free. Yeah, it's like a UPS truck. You just pull up in front of your house and bring stuff into your house. That's right. I got it free. Didn't buy it, didn't earn it, nothing. I did nothing. Zero. Zip. Jesus, I have exousia. I have authority to lay my life down. I have the authority to take it again. This is what my Father commanded me to do. 1 John 3. You know that he, Christ, was manifested to. Same Greek word, pick up and get rid of, take away our sins, because in him is no sin. God commends his love toward us, Romans 5, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for all of the sinners in the whole world, every single one of them. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> Winning. How'd that happen? Did I figure something out? No, it fell into my lap. It was gr grace. God did all this without consulting me, without asking me. He just did it. Grace. Hit the whole planet. Wow. Bang. Did it hit these guys? Yes. Christ died for these 
sins. How many dead people are we looking at here? I don't know, 35, 40 million, something like that, between the two of them. Now, that's, that's killing. Only the devil kills like that, period. Nobody else does that. Would that have been covered? Yes! 40 million murders. Covered at Calvary. Incredible. How'd that happen? Grace! They didn't even know it. Nobody told them. How about these losers? One guy's killing people and eating them. The other guy's burying them in his crawl space under his house. What, what's the story on that? Grace covered it. All those sins. Dead bodies everywhere. Frying up a liver. Eating people. Cannibalism. Covered at Calvary. You thought you were a bad sinner? <laughs> you're a certified joke. You don't even you you're an amateur sinner, okay? I'm looking at a bunch of amateur sinners right here. You guys are weak. You're very weak. These guys are professional sinners. Covered at Calvary. Grace covered eating people. What? This must be heresy. No, it isn't. It's right in the bottom. How about these? <laughs> are, are even these kind of people covered? A politician. Have you ever seen a politician? Pure scum. Scum that's covered at Calvary. Scum. Christ paid the price for these people's sins. Everybody. The whole world. That's power. That's grace. How about Hamas and Hezbollah? What are these guys doing? Chopping kids' heads off. Is that covered? Yes! Chopping kids' heads off. Christ died. To chop the baby's heads off. Are you listening to me? You're not? Well, what's going to make me angry here? <laughs> Christ died for the sins of everybody on the entire planet, no matter how bad they were. It doesn't matter. Did he die for angels and Satan? Like, oh, no. Only humans. Cosmos. Humans get these benefits. No one else gets them. Insects, fish, animals, angels, Satan. No. Fallen angels. No. They don't get those benefits. They're done. There's no redemption for them. There's no redemption for them. This is a human miracle based on how great, wonderful we are. No. Grace. God's grace, he did it on his own. For his own reasons, in his own time, he did it on his own. Grace covers Hezbollah, Hitler, Hamas, you. You see how I lumped you guys in with that? You didn't catch that, did you? No, so a lot of time I'll sneak stuff in. <clears throat> let's, let's take a quick look at it. It's used in four chapters of the Bible. Imputation is the way the King James Bible translated. Imputation. It's used over two things. Two things. Sin. One. Two. Righteousness. It's only used in two Two things, two subjects in four chapters, okay? Since I am unable to save myself and couldn't do it in a million years, I had to have somebody die for my sin and become my sin for me. I had to have that. I could not 
to save myself under any circumstance. I was hopeless. I was in a hopeless situation, totally hopeless. I needed mercy. I needed grace. There was no way for me to survive. And because I received Christ and accepted him as my propitiation, as my Savior, God removed the stench of my sin from me and, and imputed his righteousness into me. Thank you. I'll be doing autographs later. I got an imputation. See? Logizomai means to put it on your record. Okay? Uh, you know, when you go to the grocery store, uh, there's nobody there to help you. They make you stand in line with the machines now. And you go up to the machine and you start going, boop, put the item in the bag, doofus. <laughs> Dang, this thing insulted me. I put it in the bag. Put your card in. Try another card, idiot. Oh, who's... Can, can I have a human? When did, where do you get humans anymore? What happened to them? I don't like going to fries. You go down the thing. Boop. Boop. Something always malfunctions. I'm not even joking. And then you got to stand there like you're a certified idiot. <laughs> While somebody else stops screwing up on their machine so you can move in and screw up on your machine. It's unbelievable. I'm not joking. That, that's how these big companies don't want to pay employees anymore. They're building these machines to replace us, and it's not fun. Boop. Put it in the bag, loser. Oh, gee. Boop. Boop. And God forbid if you bring up something from the produce department. I am not even joking. I mean, it's, it's a living hell at Fry's. you got to go through a series of boop, beep, boop. No, that's asparagus. Boop, no, those are beans. Oh, my God. Don't they have a human? That's Logizumite. I'm, I'm, I'm scanning something. Boop, and it's put on my account. It's, put, it's imputed to me. I got, I got the bill from Fry's. After I asked for help, that's another great thing, isn't it? Yeah, you got to stand there like you're a certified imbecile and raise your hand like you're in third grade and somebody comes over to you that looks like they fell out of an alien area 54. You need some help. Yeah, Lurch walks up to you. They walk up and they start going, bah, 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 and you go, how did you, what, well, boop. Uh, are you kidding me? You go, you go check it. Have you ever been to the grocery store lately? Am I the only one? You go through one of these machine things, and, and the first thing you want to do is go back to the liquor department. <laughs> I mean, it's painful. It's painful. Particularly if you get produce. You're done. You're done. You're better off shoplifting it. You can get out of that store faster and cheaper if you shoplift it. What's going on there? Oop. Logizumai. It's imputed to your account. Bought that. Boop. It's on my receipt. Click it. I bought that. I bought, there's my receipt. See? God imputed to me. Boop. He scanned me, and I was imputed with God's righteousness, which is perfection, sinlessness, which allows me to make it to heaven. Because nobody who has sin goes to heaven. Your sin must be gone. Hello? <clears throat> the other one is sin. Paul goes over in Romans here in two chapters. Look into my imputation. When you reach the, what preachers call the age of accountability or your conscience matures, when you reach that age, and it differs with every person, at that point, when your conscience knows the moral difference between right and wrong, your sin from that moment on is now imputed to you. And it's checked on your list. Boop. Boop. 
Would you like a written receipt? Uh, yeah. Don't yell about it. Oh. oh, there's a receipt. It's on there. Every single sin, without an exception. There are no exceptions. Every single sin is collected, audited, and imputed to you, boop, put on your account. Imputation. How'd grace go? Okay, that's essential doctrine number one. You have to understand it. God just did it for you. It had nothing to do with you. Nothing. It's grace. God's grace. For everybody. No exceptions. Okay. Now let's flip over to the bad news. Grace isn't good enough. I know what you're thinking. This guy's turned into Kenneth Copeland. No. Grace is not good enough. Grace is not going to work. What? That's heresy. No, it isn't. Grace, for you to get to heaven, has to have another additive. Yeah. Grace is useless. Grace doesn't work. Grace is not going to help you. Unless it gets the other additive. What would that be? <clears throat> By grace are you saved through Faith. Okay. When Adolf Hitler died, he went to hell. He's screaming right now. When Stalin died, when your great granddad died, when all these people died, they're all in hell. They're all screaming. Well, how can that be when God's Christ died for their sins? How can that be? Because they didn't have the one thing that God requires you to have to activate his grace in your life. Otherwise, it does you no good. Usually somebody yells me at, yells at me at this portion of the teaching, but nobody yells, so I'm going to keep going then. The grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Grace covered everybody that ever lived. From Calvary to this moment, grace covers that person. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now, how the heck is that going to happen? Well, it's not going to happen by grace. You have to activate it by using your faith. Romans 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Here you see the verse, could be any clearer, grace doesn't work. Grace alone doesn't help anybody. The potential is there 24-7, 365, forever. Grace is the potential of getting help, but grace will not help you without you. Making your confession of faith, right? 
believing that in Christ here, right? That's what I'm saying. What is that person doing there? They're they're activating God's grace in their life by their confession and their personal belief. Right? <clears throat> but with the heart, man believes to righteousness. That's how I get my imputation. I get my sin removed and I get him to impute to me the righteousness of God. <laughs> my spirit, man, is perfect. See, when you go to heaven, your spirit, man, doesn't improve. It doesn't get any better. It's already perfect. Theoretically, you can't improve on something that's perfect. Now I'm getting intellectual on you. See that? I got that too. Yeah. I just hide it and do a good job of it. My heart leads me to perfection, righteousness. My mouth leads me to salvation and the new birth. Have you ever seen this car? Okay. Benetton 186. 1,350 horsepower. Most powerful vehicle on the planet Earth. This car, this car is sick. It's, I, think it, I think it runs, what, 80-something miles, uh, miles an hour in first gear. Okay. See that car? That's power. That's power. Man. Unbelievable. See that car? I got a fleet of these at home, but you know, I got tired of having them. They're boring. I sold them all. But anyway, this one, the new Corvette. Now, this thing's loaded. Uh, you got to be loaded to buy one. 85 grand for a Corvette. They come in different uh, surge sources, but you can get them up to you know, 600 horsepower. And tell you what, this car is built for speed. Correct? All right. Guess what? Those vehicles are absolutely worthless. They are useless. They're just something to look at. They don't do anything unless you got a key to turn that thing on. You got to have a key for $85,000 Corvette. Other than that, it's just a yard ornament. It has no value. All you're doing is parking it out there, showing it off. That's all you got. You got to have a key to turn that thing on. Grace is a Formula One race car, and you are not going to go anywhere unless you have the faith key. The car is useless. All it's doing is sitting on your lawn, paying huge insurance premiums. You imagine the premiums on a new Corvette. You want know what that costs a month to insure that car? Huh? For liability? Able to drive at that speed? Gee, come on. You have to have an umbrella policy to cover your liability insurance. The car is worthless. Why? Got to have a key. Romans 5, being justified by faith. <laughs> I got offered all these benefits from God. I didn't even ask for them. I didn't ask. I didn't know about them. He just walked up here. This is for you. Well, you know me? I didn't even know he knew me. I didn't even used to believe in God when I was younger. I didn't even believe in God. <laughs> I had no idea there was massive grace waiting for me. I was ignorant. Don't raise your hand if you're ignorant, but I was ignorant. But, my God, 
Well, I heard the gospel story. I went down that all. I fell on my knees and confessed my sin, begged for mercy. I could, couldn't believe it. The Holy Ghost ran over to me like we were the best of friends. I, I got saved. I got imputed. The righteousness of God was imputed to me. Nothing I earned, nothing I knew about. It just was the grace of God provided it for me. I hit it. We have access to God by what? Faith into the grace. That's what a Corvette sounds like. Yeah, I, I studied it. <laughs> Look at that grace car. I'm going to fries. <laughs> oh, oh. Which we are doing what? Rejoice. Have you seen me tonight? Talk, giving this Bible study. I've been giggling and laughing. What I'm doing is I'm rejoicing because I had all this grace I didn't even know about staring me in the face and I didn't even know it was there. But when I heard the preaching gospel message, I thought, whoa, I need to activate that grace of God. I need a key to get, turn these blessings on. I need a key to get to heaven. What is that? My key? What key is it? I'm rejoicing tonight because of these things. See, without faith, see, grace isn't pleasing God. He already provided all that for you. That's, that's not what makes him happy. It's you putting the key in and exercising your faith. That makes him happy. He enjoys that. God has feelings just like we do. He feels stuff. Huh? It's impossible to please God without faith. All this grace doing him, I'm doing anybody any good, including him. I mean, wouldn't that be disappointing if you get you handed Adolf Hitler a truckload of grace and the guy commits suicide and goes to hell? I mean, that would have to hurt father, knowing that was available for the guy. Huh? Just a thought. It's not possible to please God. Without faith, but everyone who comes to God, what is that? Coming to God, that is you exercising your faith. That's not grace, it's faith. You're stepping out, you're making your move. They must believe that he is, not was, but is, exists now. He's right here now. He'll be here at this altar call tonight. And you have to believe that God rewards people who... Seek them by, yes. God gets a kick out of your faith. He likes it. Makes him happy. Happy. He rewards people. Anybody? No. Sorry. Uh-oh. Now we got problems. Better sit down before I give this one. Ooh. He rewards people. Not everybody. Mm -mm. No. Not everybody. You want a reward from God? You have to do what? X the tail. You must aggressively pursue him. Hi, Jesus. How are you? Not interested. Okay, that casual crap doesn't work with God. He wants somebody who's coming after him. What's that doing? Exercising your faith aggressively. Oh, my God. There's different kinds of faith, isn't there? Yeah. Uh-huh. I already told you about Oral Roberts. You read his book, didn't you? Yeah, he fasted a couple months. 
lost all kinds of weight, praying to God. He wanted to see people healed in his church and they weren't being healed. Remember? Yeah, he was fasting and praying every day, setting aside. His congregation started worrying about him, so he too skinny. What's wrong with you? Why are you all that weight? What happened? God rewarded him because he was diligently seeking him. See? You can't casually seek God and get anything out of him. Hello? <laughs> Why do you think people that are super anointed, how'd they get that way? Well, they're not like the, a regular Christian. 90% of Christians are useless and gutless. This small percent of them are God chasers. And they're the ones that get the miracles. Well, Brother Mike, I'm lazy. Listen, that's your problem. You're not going to get anything from God. Because God rewards people who aggressively pursue him. God chasers. Pushers. Years ago, I was teaching in a rehabs, rehab center for addicts. It was called uh, Streets of Joy. And it was over here. See, where's my directions? Over here on 12th Street. Uh, north of Indian School, 12th Street, North of Indian School. And I was over there. I'd go over there once a week, and I'd have to teach a Bible study. And then I'd have an altar call, cast demons out of a few of the guys. And this guy raises his hand one day. He says, uh, you know, I used to be Married and had kids, and I had my a successful business. He had an auto detailing business. I remember it. He says, uh, I had money in the bank. I had savings. My kids were in school. He says, I lost literally everything using cocaine. He said, I've never been able to understand that. I lost my wife, I lost my kids, I lost my career, I lost my car, I lost my savings account, I don't have any money, I'm broke, and I lost everything over cocaine. And he says to me, how could something like that have happened? Well, I gave him an answer he didn't want to hear, but... Let's skip that part. But the point I'm making, this guy gave everything he had to cocaine. And you can't get a Christian to get off their dead butt in the morning to spend five minutes praying in tongues. Nothing. You can't get, them to, you can't get a Christian to do anything, practically. You got to drag them. Well, this Greek word, exoteo, works in the kingdom of darkness. It works in the kingdom of light. You pursue something aggressively, evil or of God, doesn't matter. You're going to get rewarded. You pursue sin aggressively, you're going to get rewarded. You're going to be destroyed. Huge. How'd that section go? All right. Nobody got up and left. I had the miracle.
It's a miracle. I teach at the Dream Center, and uh, I have great response from the people over there. I, there's men, the women on this side, men on this side, and uh, nobody gets up and leaves. Uh, unfortunately, it's only because they're required to be there, you know. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> I kind of tell myself it's because of my energetic personality and my literal brilliance, but. They're actually forced to come see me. Now let's move into section three here because this is a very confusing section. I wanted to explain it to you because James, the great apostle James, Jesus' half-brother, threw a monkey wrench into the system, or he appears to. He actually didn't, but it looks like he did, okay? This is a very, very misinterpreted area of the scripture. Ready? Saving faith is different than faith, and James breaks it down for us. Here he goes. What does it profit my brethren, he's talking to brothers in Christ, though a man say he has faith but doesn't have any works? Can faith save him? Okay, don't panic yet. Okay, now whenever you look at the scriptures, you always have to look at the context of the text. You can't pull stuff out and then interpret it. You got to leave it in the text. Okay, all scriptures like that. You can't just pull stuff out and put your own meaning to it. But here James is talking to a bunch of people that had gotten into the church who were... Uh, proclamators, professors of faith, but they didn't have any real saving faith. So they had no spiritual fruit. And so he's bifurcating this system. And if you quickly read these scriptures, you're going to get confused. It sounds weird. But if you remember, he's talking to these people. People who say they have faith, okay, which would be like uh, us here in America. Episcopals, Methodists, Lutheran, Church of Christ, uh, on and on it goes. Do you have faith in Christ? Yeah, I do. You believe in Jesus? Yep, I sure do. What's the difference there? You, have, you must be born again, John 3. Okay? It must be saving faith. You have to be born again, right? Jesus said, you must be born again. Ganeo anathon is the Greek phrase. It means to be generated or born from above. The Holy Spirit must have come into your spirit, man, and you became a born-again Christian. You can't just say, I'm saved. Right? Okay. <clears throat> That's a major problem with these big crusade preachers, Greg Laurie, Billy Graham, Luis Palau, all these guys, okay? They have altar calls, and they have thousands of people come down. They lead them in a sinner's prayer. They have them fill out an attendance card, address, so on, where you live. And then six months from now, they follow up on these people, and they're not in the church, and they're gone. They can't find them. They're gone. vast majority of them. They're gone. What's going on there? Look, <clears throat> the gospel was never designed to be watered down and make it socially acceptable. It was never built like that. It was never created like that. So if I go to a crusade and I make Jesus out to be your best friend and you, you can have peace and happiness and joy and prosperity and everything will be wonderful for you. Just come down here and turn your life over to Christ. We're going to pray with you for a minute. Someone will ask you a few questions and lead you in a prayer. Come on down, everybody. Come on down. 
Come down here. I won't pray with you. Dear Jesus, you know, please forgive me. Uh, forgive me my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. I receive Christ as my Savior. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> What's happening there is you're not making sure the person is born again. And the problem with that is the person negotiating the Christian deal is probably not born again. Okay, so they don't know any better. They think if you just pray a sinner's prayer, you're saved. That The Bible doesn't teach that. It says you must be born again. That's a spiritual experience that's real and that each person has to have to, get, to go to heaven. That's an essential doctrine. Well, I learned that years ago, and I set my system up to preach a nasty message, uncompromising message, have an altar call. The numbers are low. But if you preach the gospel the way it's supposed to be preached, your numbers are going to be lower but your converts are going to be superpowered like they're on steroids. You're not going to get these, as Ray Comfort calls them, false converts. Thousands came down and said, oh, hallelujah, thank you, I'm saved. And then they can't find you in six months, they're gone. Okay, But if you preach a nasty message, a truthful message, and you explain to them, hey, you turn your life over to Christ, you've got to count the cost. There's a cost to count if you come down here. Don't come down here if you haven't done that. You're going to get attacked by demons if you come down here to receive Christ. You're going to set off alarm bells in the kingdom of darkness. They're going to come for you. Yeah. They're going to rake you over the coals. You get a convert coming through that message, you probably got a future powerful preacher there. Somebody who's not like, likely to backslide in two days. Hello? If you make Jesus user friendly, the system doesn't work. Everybody backslides. They're all backsliders. What man goes to war and doesn't sit down and say, hey, have we got enough to do these guys? That's happening right now in Israel. You know, the Jews sat down and said, well, we got Hezbollah up here. We got Hamas down here. Now, we, have, we, have we got the artillery, the manpower? That, and then they organized it. They said, yeah, we do. We're going in. That's what Jesus said. Who, who's not going to do that? You're going to count the cost of what you have to pay to serve God. There's a price to pay. Well, if you preach that type of message, you're not going to get thousands of people coming down, chewing gum and giggling, hallelujah. That's not going to happen. You're going to get some people who are serious about being converted to Christ if you preach a truthful message, hardcore message. Am I right? Okay. Now, James is explaining it to us. Some of these people are just false converts. See that? They say they have faith. That's what he said there. Then he says, skip down to verse 20. Check this out. Again, he's talking to a certain audience here. Who are those? Kenos, the empty ones. He's talking to the empty Christians. See that? He's talking to them. And he says to them something shocking that everybody misinterprets. Faith without works is dead. Who did he say that to? You see that? He's saying that to empty Christians. Okay? 
And of course, faith without works to them is dead. Works doesn't save you. He's illustrating what it's like for people who come down, who casually come to Christ. Then he illustrates it using the father of faith, Abraham. He says, was not Abraham a father justified by works when he had offered his Isaac, his son, up on the altar? Abraham was not a false convert. He was not an empty Kenos Christian. See ya? He was a hardcore follower of Jehovah. So his works came out of true saving faith. Not these clowns who were empty. See that? You got to look at the audience when you're looking at the text. See how faith wrought with his works. Sooner Gale cooperates, works together, teams up with. See? Abraham, who was not empty, his works completed his faith. These empty Christians over here had faith without works, and they were dead. See where he's going with this? You're not supposed to be an empty Christian. You're supposed to be like Abraham. You're supposed to, you're supposed to be a true believer, aren't you? I've got two believers here. Faith and works go together with people who are truly born again and truly believe. See that? Your works didn't save you. It's the result of your faith. See that? Your true saving faith generates works. If you're an empty-headed Christian, no. He's saying no. That your works are dead. He says here, now faith has cooperating with works, and ek out of his works, his faith was made teliao complete. God called you to good works, not to save you, but because you're saved, your works come out of your salvation and your anointing, it is not causing it. Works can't save you. Ask the Methodists, the Episcopals, the church. Ask all the denominational churches. Okay. Most of them people aren't even born again. Okay. Your saving faith generates works. See? Like a apple tree generates apples. It's natural. Ek, out of works, was his faith made complete. That's how your faith is made complete. You're not an empty Christian, and you have faith without works, and you're dead. Well, yeah, empty Christians don't generate Godly works, and they're dead. The scripture was fulfilled. Abraham believed God, and it was, here we go, imputation. Abraham was declared righteous in the eyes of God. God imputed his righteousness into sinful Abraham. Why? He believed and his works were the result of his true saving faith. And he was called a friend of God. The other people who was talking to him, they were not friends of God. Kenos, because they were empty-headed, empty of true saving faith. You have to be born again. You have to have the Holy Spirit. That's how you get to heaven. You can't just say, I'm a Christian. Saying you're a Christian is meaningless, worthless. Everybody's a Christian. During election season, politicians are Christian. 
You believe that? It's like a bunch of fallen angels parading around saying they're Christian. Unbelievable. These people are garbage. Imputation again. Here it is. It was imputed to you. Abraham's sin was removed and righteousness was imputed to him. Why? He believed. He truly believed. And his works were the result of his saving faith. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Yeah, he was his works completed his faith He offered Isaac a son upon the honor. Why because he had true saving faith. He wasn't like these Christians he was talking to Who were empty yeah. See how faith same Greek word Inner Gale cooperated, worked with, cooperated with his works. Out of his works, his faith was completed, made complete. Imputation. And of God. Chapter 2. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead. What's he talking about there? True saving faith generates works by nature. These fake Christians who say they have faith don't generate works. They're dead. And the New Testament, one after another, illustrates exactly what this teaching reveals. If you just take Matthew alone, just Matthew, look at this. Grace covered this dying leper, but he couldn't get a healing until he Grace covered the centurion's dis disabled servant, but nothing was going to happen to that servant unless somebody turned the key. Right? Oral Roberts would have died at his Enid, Oklahoma church with 120 people, and that's where he would have died. But you know what he did? He went after it. Because God's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Wow. I hope I'm helping somebody. The two maniacs of Gergesenus coming down the hill. Great God's grace covered those two psychos. They were both heavily possessed by demons. Remember that? Two guys. But they would have never been delivered had they not come down from the hill. Is this helping anybody? The boy on the cot. The Bible says Jesus saw their faith. <laughs> there you go. They saw that they had put the key in and there was no way that kid couldn't be healed You can't stop the blessing If you got a key to use you can't stop it <laughs> Somebody should have wrote that down I'll write it down later then okay, you don't like it brother Jarius daughter whoa how that guy, he left his house, she's dying, he runs downtown, Jericho, runs up to him in the street. What was he doing there? 
boom, boom, boom. Activating God's grace, he stepped out on his faith, which brought untold amounts of grace to his family. Remember that story? You don't? Well, on the way home, a bunch of people from the church show up. You know you're in trouble when a bunch of church people show up. You got no chance of making it. They hit him too. Oh, yeah. They had their hymnals and denominational documents. Hey, she's dead. Don't bother him anymore. Really? You can put the key in your pocket and walk off, or you can, as Jesus said, keep on believing. Well, the Jairus looked at the church people, said, I'm going to keep on believing. Bang. Why? There was truckloads of grace for his daughter, but she would have never been healed. Had faith not activated. See that? I'm just in Matthew. Look at that. The woman with the issue of blood. Remember, she had cervix cancer. Matthew 9. She would have dropped dead a few hours or a day or so later, right? Even though there was plenty of grace for her to be healed. Wasn't going to happen until she. Are you following this? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must believe that he's here now, not in the past, now. And he rewards all those who diligently seek him. She was dripping blood out of her vagina, pushed her way through the crowd. There wasn't any way she couldn't get healed. You turn the thing on and nothing can stop the answer to your prayer. You can't be stopped. Where do you get that at, Mike? I got it right here. Two blind men falling down the street. What were they doing? Activating God's grace. They were yelling at him. Hey! God doesn't wear hearing aid. You can yell at him once in a while. He didn't mind it. He didn't mind it. Whoa, tone it down. Cut that. Hold that prayer back. Man, I'm getting a... Man, I better go get a miracle here. No. God doesn't care if you yell at him. He wants to see you turn the key. See, he don't want you to sit there and do nothing and go back in your sin and start taking offenses, start getting upset at people. Okay, that's going to block your anointing. What he wants you to do is step out on your faith. The Syrian's mothers, remember that story? The mother came from Syria. Her daughter was being tortured by demons. Remember that? Yeah. <clears throat> she was like Brother Jarius. <laughs> See, when you go to church and you need a miracle from God, you're not going to get one because everybody at church is used to not getting a miracle. So everybody is preconditioned, or as psychologists say, systematically desensitized to fail. Okay? All these other people here, see that in a row of people? At my church, they've all been praying for healing and none of them are healed. So their mindset comes over the people. It's not working. Things, something's wrong. Oh, we'll pray for you, brother. But I don't think only that. We're going to hold you up in prayer. <coughs> really? Save it. Well, a Syrian woman came looking for a miracle from God. And the church people tried to stop her. The disciples go to Jesus, hey, see that Syrian woman? She got a mouth like a busted chainsaw. Let's get rid of her. Can you tell her to shut up? What was going on there? The Lord Jesus was 
setting this story up for us to save our lives 2,000 years later. This thing is absolutely priceless. She pushes her way through the church people and grabs a hold of the horns of the altar of God. You see that? She had saving faith. This woman had the key to the formula race car. That thing started up huge. Who tried to stop her? The church people. Church people try to stop her. Send her away. She keeps yelling. Sick of listening to her. You got to understand something. If you want a miracle from God, you're in the minority. Church people don't want a miracle from God. They want a comfortable life. They want few prayers answered here and there. They're not diligently seeking God. You can, you can be absolutely convinced of that. I've been in church for decades. I know all about it. You desperate for a miracle from God? You'll, you'll be virtually alone. Virtually alone. Because everybody else is systematically desensitized to failure. Well, they prayed, they weren't healed. They prayed, they weren't healed. Oh, I see a pattern here, not hit. Becomes a mindset. They start to think failure, think backsliding, think loss. Not this mother. Yeah, mother's love is the strongest thing there is in this world, other than God's love. Mother's love, man, it's tough. Mother's love will fight. A mother will fight because of love. She didn't even know who she's swinging at. She'll just come out swinging and yelling. What are you? Them disciples told her, hey, you, why don't you get out of here? She paid them, though, never mind. If you need a miracle from God, you're going to be on your own. You better be willing to push your way in, or you're going to end up with nothing. Nothing. If you're not going to diligently seek God, you're not going to diligently get rid of your sin, you're not going to diligently renew your mind, you're going to pay for it. You're going to be a loser. You're going to be a failure. Well, Brother Mike, you're not, you're not going to increase your YouTube listeners by talking like that. Hey, uh, screw everybody. That's the truth. That's the truth. And if you don't like it, you don't have to come here. You don't have to come here. You know, I, uh, I, uh. She pushed her, excuse me. Pushed John aside. Peter, excuse me. Let me get past these losers and get to the Savior of the world. Yeah, that's a mother's love. That's right. That's right. It's right there. If you don't believe me, Matthew 15. She pushed her way through the church people. Come on now. I mean, they weren't rioting Hamas killers. These were church people she had to fight her way through. All right, let's close with this then. Warnings of God. God's warning you. And Paul goes into Hebrews and he says, hey, you remember these Jews? They came out of Egypt and they were a stubborn, stiff-necked people. God did everything he could to get Egypt out of them and couldn't do it. Finally, when they went into the promised land, scoped it out, they came back with a report, and it was a negative report. Remember that? Two guys gave a positive report. The rest of them, negative. Church people. What happened to them? Well, they got stuck in the desert for 40 years. Remember that? They never got into the promised land. Their carcasses fell in the wilderness. Remember? Remember? Why? Because they didn't believe. They could not enter the promised land because of unbelief. Okay. Back to James. Faith without works is dead. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. Yeah, no kidding. To us was the gospel preached 
as well as to them. Gospel Greek word, euangelion, good news. Good news was preached to the Jews. Hey, if you obey and you do what I tell you, I'm taking you into a land flowing with milk and honey. And they said, no. They told him no. How did he do it? How the heck did the devil do it? You ever wonder that? How in the heck could somebody be so smart to wipe out all them Jews? How could that happen? Well, he used a technique on you that he used on them. Fear demons. That's Satan's number one demon, or fear demons. He makes people afraid. You wouldn't believe how they are a major problem in our ministry, doing deliverances and everything. You wouldn't believe it. I've had so many people come here over the years, hundreds, never got delivered. You know why? They were scared. They were scared. They're afraid. Afraid of being embarrassed, afraid of looking foolish, afraid of being uncomfortable, afraid of... There are thousands of different fears. But that's what he got the Jews with. He hoodwinked them. He hung them. You know why? They were afraid. We can't go into the promised land. There are giants in the land. We look like grasshoppers compared to them. See, fear will cause you to see yourself as nothing. Fear will rob you of every blessing you'll ever dream again. Fear demons will steal everything you ever hope to have. Number one weapon. Number one. Fear. How am I going to look? How's that going to sound? What are they going to think of me? Anxiety. Fear. Wiped out the whole Jewish nation. They all got stuck in the wilderness for 40 years. Remember that? But the word preached to them didn't promise them because it wasn't mixed with grace was available for every Jew in Egypt. Every single one of them. Oh, they got stuck in the wilderness. Oh, no. You know what the worst thing about deliverance is? Starting and then stopping. You wouldn't believe how many people I've seen over the years. And it's, it's, it hurts every time I see it. They start their deliverance and then they quit. And then they come back and see me four or five years later. I've had it happen numerous times. Brother Mike, how you doing? I used to come there five years ago. Oh, hi, yeah. I, 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 I pretend I remember him. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, Bob, how you doing? I, uh, and I say, what's been going on, man? Oh, and they give me this long sob story. I'm broke. I got no friends. I, I lost my job. Uh, that, and it goes on a litany of it for years. I go, well, hey, I, I, I warned you. I told you. You cannot start your deliverance and then quit. Because the demons will double time you. They'll make you pay twice what you paid before. You relapse, you'll be a bigger drunk and a bigger drug addict than you were before. You cannot start and then quit. They'll kill you. That little story I just told you, numerous times over the years. Nothing's gone right. My health's shot. The money's gone. Oh, really? Well, you were here four years ago at the altar. You were doing great. Why'd you quit? Hello? The Jews come out of Egypt, and then they quit. They quit. They saw one miracle after the other, and then said, oh, my God, the Nephilim were like grasshoppers. What are you talking about? You were there when the Red Sea split open, right? You were there when Pharaoh's army dropped to the bottom of the sea. 
You were there with every conceivable miracle God ever whipped up. Now you're worried about a bunch of Nephilim? Really? Right? That's the story, isn't it? You read it, didn't you? Yeah. And then the other two guys couldn't even couldn't convince them to say, hey, hey, listen, you people are crazy. We can take this thing overnight. Let's go get it. Two guys. So let's go get it. Everybody else. Standing by their tents, the Bible says, whining and crying. Fear demons will make you cry. Don't start your deliverance unless you're going to finish it. Translation, Jesus said you must count the cost. If you don't count it, you're going to get caught. Hell is going to come to breakfast at your house. They didn't mix faith in it, and it wasn't profiting him. Philippians 3, Paul said, I want to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law. He wanted God's righteousness imputed to him. See that? But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is of God through faith in Christ. Matthew 7, Jesus said, not everybody that says to me, back to James, says to me, not that they did it, they're saying this. Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Only the people who do what? Do. do. See, faith without works. Empty Christians don't produce godly works. People that are born again and have the Holy Ghost who are God seekers who diligently seek the Lord naturally produce fruit. It comes naturally. Well, I'm not producing any fruits. fruit. Hey, you can repent tonight and be forgiven and start over. No problem. Why? Because there is an avalanche of grace staring you in the face. We're in the dispensation of grace. We can't lose. Just repent of it. Just confess it. You can be restored. You can be healed. Why? Because there's plenty of grace for it. Many will say to me in that day, hey, didn't we do all these great things for you? Remember that? It says here, they said that, like James said. They say they have faith. They say they prophesied. You wouldn't believe how many people I, I've met over the years who said they were a prophet and they weren't. Embarrassing. Oh, we casting out demons. You ever watch, are you on YouTube now? Everybody casting out demons. And they all get back in. Haven't we done all these wonderful works? I never knew you. Wow. No saving faith. I never knew you. Depart from me. You curse. So where do these people go after they die? Well, that's a good question. And if they're not born again, they go to hell. Matthew 8. I say to you, many shall come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness with weeping of gnashing of teeth. What's a, who's he talking to there? Jews. Let's close with this. What kind of personality does God have? You ever wonder that? <clears throat> well, his personality has nine features. What are those? Well, this is what God's like. If anybody ever asks you, you can just turn over to Galatians 5. Okay? Put this in your repertoire. Number one, agape love, unconditional love. Number two, joy, kara, cheerfulness. Number three, peace, irene. Quiet restfulness, long suffering, macrothermia, 
Somebody who has fortitude. Somebody has some stick to it in this. Eh? So you may have given up on yourself, but Father has not given up on you. He sticks to it. He hangs in there. There it is, long suffering. That's part of his personality. Those are four features of his personality, right? That's what he's like. Well, what else is he like? Well, he's gentle. The rest of this, what does that mean? He's got character. He has a solid, strong character. You ever met somebody who doesn't have any character? We call those politicians. Number six, goodness. What's that? Death is soon. He's, he's virtuous. He's got virtue. He's got character. You can trust him. Right? Frauds you can't trust. People, someone who has character and virtue, you can trust them. If they say something, that's what they mean. If they do something, they're sincere about it. Correct? Well, you're Heavenly Father. That's how that's what he's like. This this is what he is. This is what is that? Believing with no doubts and no unbelief. Meekness. Proudness. What is that? Humility. Jesus said, Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. You will find rest to your souls. Temperance. In Cordia, what is that? Yeah, this is, this is a tough area for Christians. Wow, self-control. You know what the toughest area of self-control is? Anybody know? <clears throat> no, it's not your flesh. Nope, it's your mind. Your mind. You know how the devil controls Christians with lust of the flesh? He hits their mind first. He attacks their mind first. What's the number one method of suicide among men? Boom. Gun to the head. Women? Kills. If you get shot in the head, you take if the devil takes out your mind, your body will fall. Now, if you don't have these nine features in your personality, you got some serious problems here. A, you're either a false convert and you're not saved, or B, you are a born-again Christian who is no longer a God chaser. You got wrapped up in the parable of the sower. The thorns grew up and choked out the word. What thorns? Disappointments, heartaches, Betrayals, stress, trials, tribulation, thorns grow up and choke out God's word. Have you ever done a self audit? Good, you can do it tonight. Which one are you lacking? Which one needs to be repaired? Is it love? Is it joy? Is it peace? Yeah. You got an anxiety disorder and you're having a lot of stress. Number three's out. Correct? You serve the Lord for a while and then you get bogged down and you quit. Up. Oh, four's out. Four's gone. Huh? You don't have any character. You're a wishy washy creature. You're, you know, you kind of ride the line of, you know, I can cheat on this and get away with it. It's no big deal. Really? You got any virtue? Whoa. You don't have virtue. How can a Christian not be virtuous? How can they not have any character? How can that be? You don't have any humility? You think you're a big shot or something? Arrogant? Vain? Really? That stuff's got to go. Do you ever study all them faith healers? I have. I'll close with this. You look, you look through the faith healer list. 
they all started out, a lot of them ended up really bad, but they started out the same. They were broken, humble people. They all started out the same. Some of them got screwed up and jacked up. But in the beginning, humble God seekers, diligently serving God. Hmm? You ever heard of a guy named Benny Hinn? Yeah, this guy is extreme, extremely popular. I'm not a Benny Hinn fan, you know. I, uh, he kind of gives me the creeps, but you know, he takes a lot of criticism for stuff. He, t he teaches a lot of false doctrines. But if you go back when he was young, okay, when he was a teenager, I mean, he was a nasty God seeker. He was a humble worshiper. And that's how he got that anointing. Hello? <laughs> well, I don't like him now. It doesn't matter. You weren't there when he was 17. You're not, you're not following me. You're not getting it. Nine things. Love for others, you're lacking love. Lacking love for the lost, lacking love for yourself. That's the biggest one. Biggest one. Wow, the worst person sometimes to love is yourself. You're lacking that? Hey, you got to repent of it tonight. You got a nasty streak in you? you got a goodness problem? You got a nasty streak in you? Huh? Yeah, got to repent of it tonight. You gotta fix that. There's nine things. You're supposed to be Christ like, the Bible says. You're supposed to be Christ like. Right? And you're not, which one of these nine? Just audit yourself real quick, unless so we can get it fixed tonight. The Holy Ghost will fix anything you have faith to believe for, He'll do anything you can believe for. Because this is the dispensation of grace. All the grace is available now. In the future? No. Totally different story there. Now, we're in. There's grace and more grace to fix these nine things. Hmm? <laughs> you don't have a character? You get pissed off at people. People get on your nerves and they drive you crazy. Huh? That's a character problem. That's a soul issue. Just repent of it. Fix it. Got a hidden porn problem? That's a lust problem. Caused by what? Demons attacking your mind. They attack your mind with fantasy lust, then your body responds with physical lust. Hello? Hey, you gotta get it fixed. There's nine things you gotta fix to fulfill your destiny. There's nine steps to fulfill your destiny. <laughs> we just listed them. And there's grace to cover all of it for you. Let's pray then.